Our sermon text today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Now, some of you may remember Pastor Jeff Thompson, who served as pastor here many years ago. And in the wow, it's a small world department, Pastor Jeff actually left Bethany to go serve at my home congregation of St. John Lutheran Church in Robstown. And so he arrived there during my teenage years, and I thought he was pretty doggone cool. I mean, he was like six foot five, and he went out there and he played basketball with all of us. I was, that was just the, the cat's meow, and that was awesome. But not only that, I mean, he did a great job at t- taking our youth group and kind of really working with it and turning it around. And I know I personally will forever owe him a debt of gratitude and thankfulness because he helped me as I was going through seminary and really worked to get my home congregation to help me financially as I was preparing preparing to become a pastor. And he stuck his neck out really to do that. So, I mean, I really true him, truly owe him a huge amount of thanks. And Pastor Jeff was also very supportive of me as I was going through college and seminary and and maybe, maybe too much so. And the reason I say that is because I remember one time when uh, I had gone down to, to uh, on a college break and I was worshiping at home and, you know, I'm this young theologian in training, you know, I have a couple of semesters of theology under my belt, so I think I'm hot stuff at the time, right? And I go up to him and I say, you know, something like this, I say, you know, Pastor Jeff, you know, I know about this Jesus dying for our sins and the forgiveness of sin stuff, but I really think that what we need to be talking about is what we're supposed to do as Christians. And so I need to be up there and I just need to tell people what to do. And Pastor Jeff was very, very kind. He was very supportive. So he kind of looked at me and he said, well, you know, Kevin, Martin Luther was not against doing works. And in fact, he said that was very much a part of what faith was about as well. And that was all I needed to hear. So I was happy to go off. I mean, he kind of just stroked my ego, and I was happy to leave. But as I think about that encounter, I think Pastor Jeff was probably a little more wise than I was giving him credit for, because he knew I was kind of speaking out of arrogance and kind of this you know, newfound stuff. And, and so I think he also knew by that time my family, because he knew my grandfather, and he knew my dad, and he knew me. And he knew that there was this common thread that ran through all of these Haug gentlemen. And it was a thread called stubbornness. And and not only was it stubborn, but he knew that we liked to argue, especially if we felt it was right. And so I think Pastor Jeff was like, I don't want to argue with them. It's a Haug coming up and saying this. I don't want any part of that. So we'll just let him think what he wants to think for a while. And so he just kind of gave me my moment which is great. And I kind of held on to that moment for quite a while, in fact, you know, because I figured, you know, if everyone just loved one another, like Jesus said, and if everyone was just kind to one another, like Jesus said, then things would be great. The world would be great. All people needed to see was how loving one another would be beneficial. All people needed was education, And to have things explained to them. And then the world would be great. And you see that line of thought was reinforced by many of my college professors. And you know while I was there. Because I mean they were the experts right? They obviously knew what they were talking about. So if I could like out there prompting. Just teach everyone to love and care and be tolerant of others. Then everything would work out. The world would be changed. Unfortunately, my college professors and then subsequently I 
had badly diagnosed the problem. You see, we hadn't gone nearly deep enough. Because you see, we humans don't have a knowledge problem. It isn't our brains that keep us from having peace and harmony with one another. It's not our brains that keep us from loving one another. It's our hearts. And I didn't understand that then. But I get it now. So let me try to explain by referencing a person who is wise beyond measure, a religious guru whose insights are astounding and should be broadcast both near and far. Do you know this person I am talking about? It's Pastor Casey. (laughs) Don't tell him I said that though, all right? (laughs) You see, on Wednesday night, you know, he hit the nail on the head absolutely when he introduced our Lenten theme and preached on one of the first meals that is recorded in the Bible. And that's the eating of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. So, Even though the eating of the forbidden fruit absolutely broke the command of God, it was not the eating of that fruit that was the original sin. The original sin came in the form of the serpent's temptation when he said, you will be like God. That's the original sin, wanting to be like God. The desire to be like a little God unto oneself takes your heart and turns it inward, so that you operate on a me-first basis. So it's like, as long as I'm getting what I want, as long as I feel good about myself, as long as my wants are met first, then all is right with the world. And so based on that view, then I become the one who decides what is right and what is wrong. So it's like, you know, I don't know if you ever did this when you were a kid. You know, you get together and, and you and your friends get together and you actually make up a game from scratch. You invent a game. Have you ever done that? And you sit down and you make up all the rules and, and you decide what the rules are and then you go all and you start playing. And, and, and did you ever have that one friend and maybe it was one or two other friends or maybe it was even you that, you know, when the game turned against you and like you were about to get captured or, or something negative was going to happen to you, all of a sudden you stopped and made up a new rule? Anybody ever do that? Yeah, yeah, you, you get what I'm saying. But, and, and then I realized, you know, as I was talking about this, you know, I had to actually put it into a different kind of frame of reference, especially for the younger generation, because some of them don't go outside and play anymore. And so here's, here's y'all. So, you know, have you ever been online playing your online games with somebody, and then somebody joins into the game and starts using all the cheat codes to give themselves an unfair advantage? Yeah, you've been there, done that too. But that's... That's what happens when your heart is turned inward. You start giving yourself the advantage over and over and over again, even breaking the rules that God set forth to govern creation. And all of us are guilty of this, all of us. We are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. And that's the problem. That's why love is so complicated And that's why even though we know what the world needs now is love, sweet love, and that we'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, even though we know those things, love is a battlefield. You see, if Pastor Casey can use lyrics to song and song titles in his sermons, so can I. And I heard at least one other 80s person out there laugh, so thank you for that. Love is a battlefield primarily because our heart's motivations, the motivations deep, 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 deep down in the recesses of our hearts are self-preservation, self-fulfillment, and self-love. And the question is, how can a heart get away from those things? How can a heart change? When a heart is corrupted and damaged, how can it heal itself? I mean, can a person perform open heart surgery on his or herself? And I think we all know the answer to that question. We can't. We need something from outside of us who can fix the problem. We are in bondage to sin and we cannot save ourselves. And so the thing about it is where we could not and cannot, God did. God did. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. That's what Peter writes in that opening sentence in chapter 3, verse 18. This, this one sentence captures the heart of the gospel, and it shows how our lives and hearts are changed so that we may truly love 
one another. And you see, it's not education. It's not education. It's transformation. Transformation. All in one statement. Christ suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. So let's unpack this and let's see if it hits down deep. So the opening statement, Christ suffered for our sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous. So you see, sin is not without consequences. Our sin is not without consequence. When we break God's commands, we incur a debt. And we may not be able to see it when we do such a thing, but we know it when it happens to us. So I want you to think about a time when someone has hurt you physically or emotionally. Do you remember the pain that you felt? Think about a time someone may have started a rumor about you. Do you remember the anxiety that that caused? Do you remember the stress that you went through? And, and, and if, you, if that hasn't happened, have you ever seen someone that you love get harmed? You know, someone was, something was stolen from them or someone treated them badly or their reputation was drugged through the mud. Do you remember the anger that you felt? And, and do you remember what you wanted to have happen to the perpetrator? I mean, did, 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 what did you want to happen to that other person? And maybe you're a better person than I am, but I'll tell you what I wanted. I wanted them to experience the same sort of pain that I experienced. I wanted them to suffer just as much as I had suffered because I felt that they owed me. You know that feeling? So you see, that's... That's the debt, the debt of sin. And the hard pill to swallow is, is that we have caused that kind of pain to others. And we've caused that kind of pain to God. And justice demands that we pay the price. Justice demands that we suffer as much pain as we have cost. So how do we pay that debt? How can we pay that debt? How can we account for what we have done? Here's the good news. Jesus pays that debt for us. Jesus suffers for our sins. When he goes to the cross, he takes our sin upon himself, the righteous for the unrighteous. You know, just like in the Old Testament when a spotless lamb was offered up for the sins of a person or the community, Jesus offers himself up as the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes our sinfulness upon himself and then gives to us his righteousness. Again, like Pastor Casey said on Wednesday, this means that when God looks at us, he does not see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus covering us. Jesus has taken care of it. They're all gone. Justice has been served because Jesus pays our debt. And you know as well as I do, this isn't something that we deserve. This isn't something we earned. Far from it. As sinners, God would have been perfectly just to punish us, to, to cast us away from him, to, to make us suffer from what, for what we had done and left undone. But that's not what we received. Instead of receiving punishment, we received grace. Jesus suffered for us once for all. That means there's, there's nothing we've done to receive this grace. There's nothing that we will ever have to do to receive this grace. All is accomplished by Jesus. Everything. All the sins that you have committed and all the sins that you will ever commit are paid for. Jesus paid it all. And the question is now, what does that do to you? What does knowing that you were bought with a price do to you? What does it do to your heart to know that someone took the punishment that you deserved? What does it do to you when someone gives you something that you didn't earn? See, I remember when I was, a story long ago, this is true, you know, uh, when I was about 10 or 12 years old, um, for some reason, my grandfather had come over to our house uh, when I had to mow the lawn, and he watched me mow the lawn, and I was using just this old push mower uh, to mow about half an acre of land. And a, a few days, few weeks later, I remember we got a phone call. I got a phone call from my grandpa, and my grandpa said, you know, Kevin, you need to come over to the house. So my parents took me over to the house. And when we got there, grandpa took me over to the shed. 
And he said, Kevin, I got something for you. So he opened the door to the shed, and sitting right there in the shed was a brand new self-propelled push mower. I still remember, cherry red, bright, shiny, beautiful. And some of you may snor- snicker at that and say, you know, that's just like giving your wife a vacuum cleaner for Christmas. Uh, <laughs> But Grandpa said, it's yours. And it, it was nothing like that because this was the most expensive thing that I ever received at the time. And I, I was just, I was floored by it. And, you know, and, 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 and my grandfather put his arm around me. And he, he had never done that in his life. And, and I put my arm around him and we started walking back to the house. And it was one of the very, very few times that as we were walking, he looked at me and he said, Kevin, I love you. And he never said that. He never said that. You know, he, he, was a, he was a World War II vet who kept his heart very, very guarded because of everything that he had seen during the war. So he never said, I can count on one hand the amount of times that he said that in his life. And that was one of the times. And I guarantee you, at that moment, as we were walking there hand in hand, uh, arm in arm, going back to the house, my heart was full and overflowing of love for my grandfather. If he would have told me to charge hell with a bucket of water, I wouldn't have hesitated. I'd have grabbed it and gone, man. I mean, you know, I would have done anything for that old man at that particular point in time. Because I had received this undeserved gift that I knew had cost my grandfather a ton, at least at the time. But you see, that, that's what grace does to you when it hits you down deep. Because my heart was not thinking about me. My heart was thinking all about my grandpa. That's what grace brings to you when you understand your sin and then you understand what God has done through Jesus Christ to save you. Your heart just does a complete 180. It's no longer turned inward, but it is out turned towards God and it overflows with the desire to please the one who has saved you. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. You see, if you can say amen to that, then you have been brought to God. You've been brought to God. Through the cross, you have been brought into a place where you are no longer seeking self-satisfaction. You're no longer seeking self-preservation. You're no longer seeking self-aggrandizement. You are seeking God to please God, to love God, to worship God, to follow God's will and walk in his way. And your heart is overflowing because you know that you have been loved with a love that is greater than anything that you could ever imagine. I mean, your heart is overflowing because you have been given a forgiveness that you could never repay. And your overflowing heart now touches others because you want others to feel this and experience this this marvelous, wondrous grace, mercy, and love that you have felt deep within your soul. And it changes how you move and act in the world. I mean, you love because you've been loved. You forgive because you've been forgiven. You extend grace because you have received grace. And that's what changes the world. And it all starts not with our actions, not with demanding that people love one another, but it starts with Jesus' actions on the cross and then his resurrection. And then with our telling others about what Jesus has done. Peace, justice, and mercy arrive one changed heart at a time. And you see, that's, that's why we diligently prepare for these great events. I mean, this, this is why we set apart 40 days in Lent to prepare our hearts and minds to hear the great news. Because these are the central events in our lives of faith. But not only that, I would argue they are the central events in the life of the world because they are hope for the world. For Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. May our hearts be captivated by this news this day and every day. Amen.